John 12 and 21, then the same came therefore to Philip, which was Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate study. Now, I know you think, some of you think you got it cornered. I know you've taken this class before. But I tell you what, you can skip this one when you're walking on water, turning the other cheek, nailed to a cross, and, and shed blood that can cleanse us from our sin. I need this class. Amen. Let's place our Bibles down and let's let's talk to our subject and let's talk to Jesus right now. Lord, we love you. We need you. Thank you for your presence, for your power. Lord, we need you. You are the most important thing that we can emulate, that we could pursue, that we could study to know. Lord, help us tonight as we go into your word and seek you out more than we've ever known before. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Jesus is the ultimate ology. Ology comes from the Greek word logos, and that's the word where we get logic. It's important that we study. Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a lot of, ask a college student, there's a lot of ologies in this world. Anthropology is the study of mankind, and biology is the study of life, and criminology is the study of crime and deviant behavior, and Astrology is the pseudoscience that claims to discern information about human affairs and terrestrial events by studying the movements and relative positions of celestial objects. I hope you wrote that down. It's important. Psychology. The scientific study of mind and behavior. This world has turned to science. Doctors, prescriptions, higher learning, alternative lifestyles. Humanity seems to be willing to try just about anything. But I'm here to preach and teach about Jesus. The overlooked answer. The last resort. <laughs> but Jesus is still the only remedy for sin. When you think about it, the Catholics took Rome, the Muslims have Mecca, the Seventh-day Adventists have Loma Linda, California, the Mormons infiltrated Salt Lake City, Scientology has Clearwater, Florida, gamblers have Las Vegas, the gangs have Los Angeles, the confused have Santa Fe, New Mexico, and San Francisco, and the mafia has Chicago. Why can't the apostolic church, the Jesus name, people have a place? <laughs> mm -hmm. A place that's not known for underhanded dealings, for backstabbing and gossip and human vice. A place where believers call home because the ultimate ology will never be crime. Horoscope or the stars, the ultimate ology is still the study of Jesus. Human systems of the world, if you paid attention, they can't be repaired. Today, and our elected officials have become thieves and liars. They simply go by the title of politicians. They no longer seek the good of the people more concerned about poll numbers in their own pocketbooks. So unless there's a divine intervention, things in our country and world are not really going to be repaired. I guess it punctuates the fact that the Lord says you won't create a new heaven and a new earth. 
The world doesn't need rehab. It needs to be reborn. It needs Jesus and a new birth experience. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 22 says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You have to understand, this planet is groaning. This, this, this planet is shaking and quaking. And the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the earth is going to continue to travail and groan. And you can pass it off as a news story. But just a few days ago, uh, uh, January the 15th, Tonga volcanic eruption happened. And it, it sent shock waves that actually went around the world and sent uh, 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 waves to as far as to Alaska and even San Diego. That happened is I thought I did a little research and just as of December, as of 9th of December, 46 volcanoes are in eruption status. That La Palma eruption in Spain, it, if, it, if it actually does indeed go kabooey, it's going to affect our East Coast. In fact, when it first went off and I listened to the uh, the stuff on the internet about what was going on, I was, I was concerned for uh, my in-laws because it could affect them. In the last 24 hours, there were 253 earthquakes around the world. And if I read correctly, there was 88 in the United States alone. Our drinking water isn't safe anymore. My generation drank out of the hose without worrying about it. That's because what mankind has poured into this earth and what they've done to the earth, they poison. Let me tell you something. It's still the same way. We got a whole bunch of people talking about Jesus that don't know him. Mm -hmm. they, they've taken the Bible and twisted it and turned it, and it doesn't resemble anything that Jesus. You have anybody twist your words? How to make you feel? What do you think God's going to feel like when he comes back and deals with that mess? Our air quality is suspect, depending on where you live. And I meant to go get a look on the air and see how big that plastic island is that's floating out in the ocean. I think someone said it's the biggest Rhode Island now. Our plastics are killing our marine animals and all that kind of crazy stuff. The, the planet is groaning. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not, a, I'm not an earth burster. I'm not a tree hugger. Uh, in fact, if I wasn't pastoring a church and made certain commitments to God, I'd be a hunter and a fisher right now. I'd be doing that when time would permit. But, you know, I'm in the study of the ultimateology. The earth is pulsating in seismic travail. And it should concern any one of us who calls themselves a disciple. You can't sit back unconcerned and, and, and think you can just shove this aside and meander along some sort of life of carelessness. Being a disciple, there ought to be an urgency in your spirit. In fact, the Bible says, hear what thus saith the spirit under the churches. Do you hear that? Can you hear that? Can, can you hear what's going on and, and feel what's going on in an urgency that I need to be in the house of the Lord? I spent yesterday afternoon and I'm just bummed out that the people responsible for getting it, that they're not here tonight. And he laid on the floor in the altar and he cried out to God because he wants to get his, his life straightened out. It should concern us as believers. If you call yourself a disciple, if you call yourself a believer, you should be concerned right now. Because of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, he says, and when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that had been they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said, Master, rebuke your disciples. He answered and he said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones 
would cry out immediately. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something here. Why is the earth doing that? Has the church gone silent? You call yourself a believer, but yet you're more concerned with. Now, I'm not trying to make nobody feel bad. I just try to get people to heaven. I'm not, I'm, I, I don't, you know, if, 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 if this stuff bothers you, maybe you should maybe listen more intently. There ought to be something about us that when, when, when I realize and see these signs that are going on, there ought to be something about me. My, where's the church when we realize that hell is on the other side? of your last breath. Where's the uncompromising church of believers that are saying, you know what? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to put away some of this junk and triviality. Let's get on. Where are the husbands that are leading their wives into the safety of the house of God? Where are the mothers that are counseling and calling the church? Get in the church. Lay aside all these weights and sins that are earth is letting us know and his coming is imminent. The prophet Joel stated, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children of those that suck the breast. Get those babies in here. And let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, chamber and the bride out of her closet. The sad thing about the closet is Seems like all the confused folks have come out of the closet. The trans, the binary, the, the effeminate, the butch, the gay. And for the church to come out of the closet. It's time for the church to come out of the closet to, and declare the things of God. It's time that, 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 that we that, that are the church magnify God. Lift him up, declare his name, not be afraid to, to walk in holiness and righteousness, not being afraid to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to beat this battle called my flesh. Maybe it's time to let them know we're not going away. I uh, was going through my Twitter feed a little while back, and this guy got on there of a certain persuasion. I had my wife watch it. We're not going away. We're here to stay. And he was so proud in, well, I don't know. She, he, I don't know what he, hey guy, we're not going away either. But when we do, when he takes us, you're going to be in a world of hurt. You better thank God the church is still here. You better thank God you can come sit in these chairs tonight. They ought to get a fire. Some of you men call yourself ministers. You better get on fire for this thing. I pray God, send me some help. Send me some help. Send me some help. Let me tell you something about this place right here. I'm not looking for talent. I give a rip how good you speak, how good you sing. I want consecrated. This isn't a platform. This is not a stage. It's an altar. You get consecrated if you want to preach here, if you want to sing here. I don't give a rip how good you do it if you're not consecrated to God. You want to do that worldly junk? Go do it on their stage. He ought to let me up there. I'm good at it. You're out of your rabbit mind. Come on, church. Listen, you can know him. I'm so thankful that my pastor, he almost, he, he, it was all about knowing Jesus. So the problem with some of you is you know what you like, but you don't know who you should love. You're committed to your culture, and you bypass the culture of Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish that one later. If you'll read the Bible, if you'll grab, in fact, one, one lady in our movement has a thing called out, eat this book. Sounds weird. But if you will devour this book, the problem with you, you got your magazines, 
You got your Facebook. You got all that. And you can justify. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. Never justify your carnality. That's the devil's trick. If you ain't spiritual, that's an indictment. You better get spiritual. You ain't going to get a bypass because you're young or because you're old. And the best friend you ever had will be Jesus, not yourself. You will lead yourself astray. You better have a friend in Jesus. You better get that fixed. Read this book. Jesus makes sin remittable. You have to understand, thank God, he makes it remittable because to us it's formidable. You know what else he does? He makes joy attainable. He makes heaven reachable. He makes holiness reasonable. And he makes Christianity practical. I want to have a living, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Solomon admonished in Proverbs 23 and 23, buy the truth and sell it not. You ought to put a sign up on your life. I ain't for sale. I ain't for sale to my glory days or my future days. I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Ain't for sale. I'm buying the truth and I ain't giving it up. You know, if we had that idea about scripture like we did some of the cars we sold. If we had that idea about, oh, man, I should have bought that property, right? Should have, oh, my God, we ought to get a hold of My God, let me get a hold of this. Let get all my money, all my life, all my time and energies in this. Oh, Wednesday night, I better, let's get back to teaching. You know, to... Pay attention. To most apostolic Pentecostals, the truth is Acts 2.38. Brother Corey, you're growing so much, I'm so proud of you. But there's nowhere in the Bible that makes that claim. Some of you don't learn something. The truth, folks, is not a doctrinal position. The truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the lie. Jesus said, I am the truth. He said, I am the way. I, I am the truth, and I am the way. The truth is not a doctrinal position. Now, it's true that Acts 2 8 is indeed the plan of salvation. That's a doctrinal position. But the truth is, Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Listen to 2 Thessalonians. I said this the other day, and I think it fits again. You need to pay attention. Because if this don't light your fire, and this doesn't get in your craw and get in your spirit, you may be deceived. The sad thing is you may not be deceived, but you have slow control of your pride. Your arrogance, that you'll fight against it because you'll be pointing to me and not realize it's his word. He chose the foolishness of preaching. Get on to him for that. Go ahead, call him out on that. Let me know how that works. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Let me help you. Nobody's going to get grandfathered into what you used to do. If you think age is a past, I don't think your age compares to God. I can't say, well, I've been around here a long time and I'm older than you. Y'all need to. I don't give a rip. What's the word say? What's the word say? Listen to this. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. If you ain't right, you're not right. You don't get a pass because how young you are, or how old you are. And them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth. But that pork preached on that a little bit. Reason people don't make it, they don't have a love for the truth. I'm gonna tell you that the worst thing you do is fall in love with yourself. You better fall in love with Jesus. If you're in love with yourself, you will deceive yourself. You hearing me? You receive not a love of the truth. 
Well, I can say it this way. They, did not, they received not a love of Jesus. They didn't fall in love with Jesus. One in the same. Mm-hmm. That they might be saved. It's talking about salvation here, folks. For this cause, listen to this, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are some powerful things that are contained in that, that, those two verses right there. If you want to believe something that's wrong, bad enough, God will help you. If you choose to walk away from him and believe something that's in error, and you're adamant, you put your foot down, and you think because you're such a much, or you're something special, you're, you're determined with your stance. It literally says, God said, here's your delusion. You go believe your lie. Let God be true. Hey Amen. This message for everybody in the room. The next thing is that people didn't receive a love for the truth. You do realize that it was one God people that killed Jesus. They, they held a great doctrinal position. They were doctrinally correct, but they had no concept of who he really was. There's a lady in, in, in the book of Acts that was following the, the apostles. The Bible says that she came behind them and said, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. She was doctrinally correct. But her attitude was wrong. She is saying you need to listen to them to be saved. The apostle turned around and rebuked her. That's the devil out of her because Although what she was saying, be careful when people, they'll say, the, 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 they'll agree with you in truth. She was doctrinally correct, but her spirit was wrong. Mm, be careful when you're okay, when your spirit is wrong. Oh, I, it, you, it ain't no grandfather in here. Guy, oh, no, you got time. So you can have that bad attitude, that incorrect. Yeah, you can turn around and, oh, yeah, we know. I know you believe in me. I'm just going to let you come in even though you've been a jerk. You say stuff. You write stuff. You put stuff out there that's contrary. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. He came out that same hour. Same hour. The word declares God is a spirit. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. In fact, you can't even say you're one of his without the spirit. When's the, when's the last time? Trust me, Jesus ain't the blockage. What is the stuff in your life that's the blockage? What is your ideology? Well, you can't preach on that's not wrong. Well, why don't you start eliminating things till you get back where you should be and we'll find out what's wrong with you. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Truth is right information. The Spirit is the right attitude. Ever heard of something? They got a bad spirit. I'm going to say something here. we got to be more than just Acts chapter 2, verse 38, people. 
we got to be more than just people that believe in holiness and standards and faithfulness. You got to be people of the right spirit. We got to be people of the light. You can't shine in darkness if you are that darkness. You can't sit back with your long sleeve standards and your pious little seat and scream, I have truth, I have truth. And have a rotten attitude. Ought to get your brother, bad spirit. Oh, that's just a pastor. That don't apply to me. Well, I don't need a pastor. You know, I, I, I've been around long enough to be around folks that have been like, and I kind of had this experience today, been sucking on lemons your whole life. You know, I, I, I'd rather work with people who can be taught. I'd rather be around folks that are teachable. Yes. They're honest about their errors yes. Amen. and their doctrine, and they got a great attitude. And show me. Yes. Help me. Yeah. I just rather have people like that than people who are adamant in their doctrine and have a rotten attitude. I don't care if you know, here is the Lord our God is one Lord. I don't care if you know Acts 2.38 yes. yes. if you're ignorant. If, if, you, if you got a bad attitude and give a rip about the church and you rip about your neighbor and you turn around and you, and you think you're doing the church a favor by showing up. This is, this going to be one day where everybody realize what, a, what an awesome thing this is. Just because the world isn't giving it a vote of confidence, trust me, the angels and the great cloud of witness going, go church, go church. You may not give a rip. You may not think, well, let me just find my seat and get in and put up with power. Let me tell you something. The angels say, man, I wish we could do that. I wish we could be there. Oh, that there'd be an old time sinner in there going, I thank God for the church. I thank God for the altar. I thank God for that old rugged cross and that water of baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Lord. I'm thankful for it. After 36 years, I'm still thankful for it. Attitude is important. Attitude and spirituality are so powerful and they are preeminent. You need to be people of the truth, but you got to be people of the spirit. If you aren't people of the spirit, you are easily moved by the wrong spirit. You're easily influenced and you're okay. I'm going to be honest with you, if I was, uh, uh, right now, go on, put on one of your worldly songs in here right now. Go ahead. Put on the last one from your nasty old playlist. Wouldn't go in here. Should it go anywhere? Let me explain this to you deeper. The Bible does. Jesus talked about the, the pearls. Matthew 13. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had. And some of you trying to buy it at a cheaper price. Some of you think you're going to be able to get it without but the kingdom of heaven is people that sell out for this. Once you purchase the truth, you take down that for sale sign I talked about a little while ago. You take a dance, uh-uh, ain't nothing. My past, nothing gonna buy me back into that junk. I I'm, I'm belong to Jesus. That term bought it literally means to acquire it. The only way to get it is to get Jesus. Jesus didn't say, I'll show you the way. He said, I am the way. Ah, Jesus didn't say, I'll teach you the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And since this is the case, you can't trade it for anything. You don't trade it for financing. You don't trade it for relationship. You don't trade it for prestige. You don't trade it to get along with people. When you're baptized in his name, you got Christ in you, the hope of glory. You got the truth. Love the truth. Don't fall into the category of those who didn't receive a love 
for the truth. See, the scary part is you can have the truth but not love it. You see, believing in God but not believing in Jesus is like believing in rock but not believing in stone. <laughs> Study the Bible all you want. There's no such thing as studying the Bible that excludes Jesus. Listen to these verses in Luke, chapter 17, 35 through 37. Two women shall be grinding together. Listen. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. And the disciples, they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? What? Open your Bible. That's what it says. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. This entire thing is talking about the coming of the Lord. Go read the chapter. For the sake of time, and I want to get you out of here a decent amount of time. Y'all need to turn the light on back there so I can see the clock. It's not fair to these guys. Thank you. I don't want to hold you too late, but I do want to give you something tonight. Are you listening? Trust me, you've never heard this before. What are you talking about, eagles and carcasses, Lord? Anybody, anybody could answer? Sorry, I didn't expect you to. You know, there's two primary eagles in the Mediterranean. You got the Benelli's eagle and the golden eagle. And their eyesight is amazing. amazing. They, their, their vision, their just ability to see is. But in all that, what is Jesus saying? He's answering the question that, wouldn't you like to know it right now? When's Jesus coming? When's he coming? You know, we are given clues and people are consumed by this. They've been don't, don't think it's new. Man, it's been going on for a long time. People, when's Jesus coming? They've been preaching about his coming for a long time. When will his return be? And the Bible does give us some clues in various places to help us know. But Jesus, in these verses, Luke tells us two women are working together and suddenly one disappears. Two men are working and suddenly one disappears. Okay. So the disciples asked a question and they answered and said, Where, Lord? And he said, And then where over the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. You know, they didn't ask when. They asked where. Where, Lord? What is Jesus saying here? How do we go from when to where? Jesus is saying, just as sure as the eagles can find a carcass in the wilderness, the important part is I'm coming back and I'm coming to get my church, the body of Christ. I will know exactly where my church is. So the question for us is not when he's, he is coming back, but rather where we should be when he returns. The answer to that is you have to be in the body. You have to be in the body. You have to be born into this church. That's the answer. Doesn't matter the time of the hour. If that was important, he would have told us. The importance is where. Where, Sister Crow, when he comes back, will you be? Where, Brother Bruce, will you be? Where, Brother John, where? I pray you are in the church. Because it don't matter when, if you're in here. It doesn't matter. You better love the church. You better love the standards. You better love holiness. That's what makes the body. That's what makes the church. He, ah, well, let, let me just let me just stay let me just stay here. First Corinthians tells us, chapter twelve, for by one Spirit we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. 
For the body is not one member, but many. Not coming back just for the me's and the you's and all those lone rangers that think I got my own way. He's coming back for the people who have an understanding that I need to be a part of the body of Christ. You know, I've heard a lot of when the Jesus is coming stuff. I was raised around it. I, I remember as a kid, before I was concerned, hearing about this giant computer in, in Eastern Europe, I think it's Belgium, called the Beast. It was, it was the size of a, it was gigantic, it was ginormous. Call your dad probably remembers more about that than I remember the barcodes and the 666 stuff. I don't want to buy that. It's got a barcode on it. I remember when Mikhail Gorbachev was going to be the Antichrist because he had that birthmark on his head. And some of you weren't born yet, but there's a book and a pamphlet that came out, 88 Reasons He's Coming in 88. I, I remember when the Y2K thing came and we were having our watch night service and I was in another part of the building and one of the members of the church decided to play a prank and because everybody's worried at Y2K, the computers couldn't navigate, and negotiate the zeros. And so all the power grids were going to shut down and people were, saying, hey, your parents and your aunts and uncles were, were filling their bathtubs with water and buying cases of raviolis and beads and all that, they, they were all storing stuff up and the power's going to go out. They're all going to die. And I'm in another part of the church. I'm getting ready for watch tonight. And the power goes out in the church. I knew Jesus hadn't come. I knew Tom had showed up. <laughs> Went over there and popped the power on the church. Knucklehead, now we got to fix all the clocks. Anybody who went over Y2K? Jesus is coming. It doesn't matter when he's coming. It matters where you are. Okay. Listen to what the book of Revelation says. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Chapter 19, verse 10. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of now, if you're not already serving God, well, honestly, Jesus' coming should scare you to death. Now, I like to kid and joke around. I like to have fun like the next kind. I try to be positive. I try to be optimistic. I, I'll tell you right now, if there's breath, there's hope. Amen. Amen. But in all honesty, when it comes to this world, young people, and I'm sorry. I'm not optimistic about the way this thing's going. The handwriting is on the wall. It's a mess and it's getting worse. And, 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 and you know what? The problem, let me tell you something. You may struggle with the word of God, but you are also benefits that it's kept a lot of stuff at bay. But sadly, they've just about got this thing shoved out. Now, there's no longer, the whole, no longer, you have to understand, this whole stuff that you kind of feel okay with, this whole gender stuff is a, just another way to deny God and his creativity. You were created by a wonderful Savior. You were created to be like you are. Layla, there ain't another human being on this planet like you. There ain't no one hold a candle to your beauty. No one can hold a candle to, to who you are. You, you are fearfully and wonderfully and meticulously made. You are wrought. God, God said, I'm making this girl like this. There ain't another Pearl Bruce on the planet. We joke and get around with your stature, brother. If there ain't another one you around. world has done everything it can to kill God because when you struggle in your teenager, the last thing you want is accountability. And sadly, when you get old, you don't think you can have accountability. But guess what? You can't have accountability without responsibility and vice versa. The handwriting's on the wall. It's a mess. It's getting worse. And it's not going to get it's not going to go back 
to what it used to be. It's going to get even worse. That's, you have to be a part of the kingdom of God. That's why. You need to be a part of the body of Christ. That is why you are born into the church. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Guess what? I ain't going to be part of the world's government. Get me in. Get me in Jesus. <laughs> You can love this world. Go on. But I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. Amen. You can go ahead and straddle the fence and think that your righteousness is good enough, that Jesus is going to be like yours instead of, but I'm going to go all in with the church. If I'm the only one here. I'm going to be all in with the church. There, there's, there's people that are scared stiff over this messed up world. You don't think so? Go look at the pandemic and the masks and the mandates and the shots and the boosters and the empty shelves and the ridiculous politicians. Oh, oh man. We have a vice president that's off going to a communist uh, inauguration. It hasn't even gone down to the border where five to 7,000 people are coming across, taking your jobs, taking up. Problems are getting worse. Go ahead. Go ahead and know all that. I don't give a rip. It's just sadly some of that stuff comes across my desk and I have to see it. But I'm going to tell you something right now. As for me and my house, we're going to focus on Jesus. I, I, I know some of you, you're bored with it. You've heard it so long, you don't care about it. No, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to refocus myself and stay focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You can study God and go study theology. That's good. But some of y'all better get back into the church body and start studying Christology. You better get back to studying being like Jesus and searching Jesus out. That, that, that's the apostolic message. And I'm going to tell you something right here and right now. You ever hear that? Thing? Well, what makes you right? Okay. Was that a yawn? I'm sorry if this bores you. The apostolic message is right. It's not because I was right before I was born. It was right before I started going to church. It was right before I felt the call to preach. It was right before I ever got here tonight. It's right. It's still right. It's going to stay right. We're right on the baptism in Jesus' name. There is no more documented doctrine in the Bible than water baptism by immersion in Jesus' name. I'll give you $1,000 if you'll show me anywhere in the Bible where some accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and were saved. You can't do it. Or anyone that was baptized in the titles Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Your Bible dictates and shows and, and uh, baptisms occurred in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19. There's only four places in the Bible where people were baptized by immersion after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why are folks arguing with that? Why do people... Why fight that? You should embrace that. Make your, your peace, calling, and election sure. It's all about Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. Oh, what, what is, in the words of Erica, what is your it? So when you read the Bible, You can say, you know what? I did it just like they did in Jerusalem. I did it just like it's written in the Bible. I did it just like the eunuch did. I did it just like Cornelius did. I did it like the believers in Ephesus did. Mm -hmm. You can find it in the Bible what we do. We need to do it just like the Bible. You can walk around the comments. Hey, well, you know what? You can argue this and argue that, and you think it's you, you, twenty. Acts, uh, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen is not a baptismal service. It's a parabolic saying for you to understand that the word name is singular in there. 
What is the name of the Father? What is the name of the Son? What is the name of the Holy Ghost? Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. Oh, take English 101. Prepositional phrase. I want to do it the way the Bible. I don't want to make stuff up. I don't want to make stuff up. I'm not going to tell someone to accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and you're saved. It's nowhere in there. I'm not going to preach that. And getting baptized in Jesus' name, getting the Holy Ghost, is just the beginning. That gets you into salvation. Now you got to walk right. You know why people can't walk right? Because they didn't start out right. Oh, you're being hard to make it hard, uh, difficult for people to get in heaven. No, people have done that. It's very clear. What did Mary say? Whatever, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Oh, Mary. Well, oh, God. I Mary, Mary got the Holy Ghost. Go look at Acts chapter 1 and 2. She was there. She called him my Savior. We're going to maintain our, our stance for the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in an unknown and unlearned tongue, because it's right. Read the book of James. The most difficult part of your body to control is your tongue. For some of you, it's your literal tongue. Some of you, it's your typing. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. How can you honestly say, listen, folks, let's get logical. How can anyone logically say God is in complete control of your life if he's, if he's never controlled the most difficult part of you. The Bible's very clear. The tongue is the most unruly. Called it a member. The body of Christ has many members. Put two and two together. I got my eye on you, Sister Crow. You have to understand, when you can yield yourself, allow God to fill you with the Holy Ghost, heaven is speaking in tongues, that's power. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your vessel being filled and that part of your body, your tongue magnifying God, that you want to talk about God having control over your life, uh, that, my friend, is the power of God in your life. When you turn around and when you get that little snide remark and you got to hold it, oh, I'm going to, oh, that's not my place. Uh, I'm going to magnify God in an unknown tongue. It's a major display of the supernatural power of God in my life. Oh, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. It's the church. That's the body of Christ. We're after here. You know, I hear it all the time. Well, you'll never build a big church, Brother Crow. You're never going to have a great church if you preach that message. That's all right. I never want a church. It's not mine. It's his. It's not mine. You're not mine. You're his. I we're his. What was me if I preached not the gospel? Oh, we're going to get to that in a minute. The church, the body of Christ. You need to be born again, not rehabbed. <laughs> oh, if I can just get a do-over. No, get born again, get right. Find an altar tonight before you leave. Get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. It would do some of you well to not say another word till you've done that. It'd do you some well to go on a fast, to get off Facebook and Instagram and just plumb shut your mouth till you've allowed God to speak through you again. Get the Holy Ghost. Evidence of speaking another tongue. Get right with God. You'll find, you'll struggle to sing those lyrics that God's like, I can't believe the same mouth is do Listen to this. I'm going to be wrapping this up, so come find a great song to make everybody feel real good. The message says it in Romans 12 and 2. I see you smiling back there, Ezekiel. Listen to this. This, this says it. And that, this says this so clear. Listen to this. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. This, this, is, this is a version. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. 
unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Isn't it time to start growing up like lady, ladies and men of God standing up, shining as lights in a dark world? People are, There's something different about them. There's something different about them. Look at how they walk and talk and act. watch what they watch and watch what they listen to, how they carry themselves, how they talk about the church, how they talk about the people, how they talk about the past. There's something different about the church. If what it's saying is don't let the world drag you down. Some of you have got to quit associating with what drags you down as the good old days. Being lost was never the good old days. It's the devil lying to you. If you feel that way, you might have be deceived. Live the way that is so focused on Jesus that you lift it up. And it don't drag you down. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm weary of folks taking the wonderful word grace and turning it into disgrace. Those folks who say grace is the mercy of God and he'll overlook everything. Too much is given, much is required. That's the danger of aging and thinking you, you, you're grandfathered in. Oh, more is required of us, not less. A higher standard is required, not less. You know, the Bible does say at a time God winked at ignorance. But he ain't winking now. His eyes are wide open. He knows who's in the body and who's not. Like that eagle, when he comes back, he knows. You may be doing and looking just like the person next to you. But God's watching the character. Paul told Timothy about how to behave in the house. Understand, being in the house of God is the body of Christ. No matter where you're at, how you behave. He knows who's in the church. That's why it's going to be shocking. You have the outside. Oh, it looked like you're going to make it, but inside here, Acts 17 and 30 says, And the times of this ignorance gone weak that, but now. Go read it. That word now is in there commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Isn't that beautiful? The grace of God says, hey, repent. Get back in the house. Get back into safety. See, in like shadow, the whole of Egypt had the death angel go over it. But that blood on the doorpost, I hope not that one. You see, when you're in the house, you got to be in the house. Titus tells us in uh, chapter 2, 11 through 13, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness. Look, if it's not godly, it's time to deny it. And worldly lusts, not even sin, just worldliness. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In it, but not of it. Not isolated, but insulated. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because he's coming. Be in the, you, you better be in the body. Grace is not mercy. Grace is divine, divine assistance. Someone... Some folks who need some divine assistance today, you need grace. Grace, grace will help you live right. The Bible says five times throughout Scripture, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." You can't be holy without the Holy One living inside of you. Grace is a teacher. Grace is not mercy. Grace is not blinders. Grace, grace is not going. I don't care what you're doing. That's not grace. I hear people say, oh, grace. We got grace at Calvary. No, the Bible says Noah found grace. In other words, God's been helping people for a long time. You know, the sad thing is, is here's God with an outstretched hand of grace to get you to come to a place of repentance, to be filled with the Holy Ghost 
And I'll tell you, even right now, in this booth tonight, somebody will sit and let the day go by. In fact, let's stand while we're here. But let me say this. We know that Grace helped Noah build the ark to save his family. God destroyed the whole world, but you know, Noah found and that grace extended to his family. It matters how you handle this extended hand. How you handle this extended hand is going to affect your family. God's grace will help you. God's grace will help you. It'll bring you into the church so you and your family can be saved. God, God, God's presence is here right now willing to help you. Listen, anyone who says behavior has nothing to do with spirituality couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible, listen, the Bible still makes distinction. Oh, please, lay, lay down the attitude. Lay down entitlement. Don't let the devil trick you and deceive you because God still makes a distinction between sheep and goats, tares and wheat. He'll let them grow together. He, there's a difference between those wise virgins with oil and the foolish without. There's a difference between the holy and the profane, between the pigs and the pearls. The Bible says in Corinthians, are you with me? Are you still with me? 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. so you can check me. I'm going to make a point here. For there must also be heresies among you. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, church, there's going to be error right here. There's going to be false. So you can be standing or sitting right next to someone right now that refuses this. And in the car all the way home will have an attitude and excuse for not fun. You have a best friend that will drag you and say, ah, it's okay to smoke marijuana. It's an herb of the field. They'll be, trust me, Ammon had a friend. Ain't nothing new. There has to be falsehoods. There has to be tears next to the wheat. There has to be. Because that will make the truth shine that much brighter. There's a reason they take diamonds and place them on that deep, dark velvet so that the facets glisten and gleam. And wow, you can see the difference as it shimmers. It catches the eye. You better believe like those diamonds. God, you don't have these. He sees clearly those in the body. Like an eagle, he sees clearly where the body is. It catches his eye. You better believe he knows who the true saints of the Most High God are. The darker this world gets, he's coming to gather his jewels. As the evilness of the world and the, all this fake, false church stuff that promotes godlessness and God is putting blinders on and he don't care. Just making the true saints of God shine like never before. Listen, hear me. Don't be afraid of the phonies. Don't be afraid of those that are fake. There has to be heresy so that which is real and approved can be made manifest. Yes, the power of the Holy Ghost following you is God's approval. Amen. Don't fret when you see this is wrong or that's wrong or that's not right. Or, let me help. Let me help. Let me help some of you right now that like to antagonize me in your own little way. It don't bother me. It concerns you. I pray for you. I preach something, you turn around and contradict it. Man, that's on you. And the sad thing is you do it to yourself. It's pathetically sad. It's okay. I'll never forget my sister, my oldest sister than I. I got an out here because I was younger. We lived on a farm and we had this levee and it had been raining and it was a mud bog. We were out there sliding down the levee and we, man, we, 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 we were covered from head to toe. I didn't see a problem with it. 
But you can understand a mother seeing a problem with that. Those nice clean floors and a nice clean bathroom and you got two kids coming walking in, look like they just dipped in mud. And my mom got so mad, but she laid into my older sister. And she laid into my sister, what do you do? But my sister, you know, being a teenager, said that, when I'm off and I'm on my own, and I got my own house and my money, I'm going to roll in the mud all I want. <laughs> How many things she went out there and rolled in the mud? It's ridiculous, but the sad thing is, is there's people that get in the church, you get sideways, you go rolling in that mud. And think, The world has AIDS. Acquired Intelligence Deficiency Syndrome. You know, sadly I've done my share of funerals. It's amazing, everyone wants to go to heaven. And I guess when you get in the Bible, you kind of realize everybody does go to heaven. problem is, is not everybody gets to stay. There's going to be a judgment. And I actually think, in fact, I can prove it in scripture, that they're going to be able to see what they could have had. I can take you there in scripture. You know, if everybody's going to heaven, what good is judgment? People want Jesus on their terms. at. You can't have a cross bigger than your Christ. I had a pastoral friend that was building a new building and this builder came in and said, well, where are you going to put the cross? Big stained glass window with a cross. He's like, no, we're not going to do that. How can you not do that? Side? How can you have a church without a cross? And he said, well, if you're going to put it that way, let's just put a big hole in the wall. It's like, why? The empty tomb. Can I tell you that what makes Christianity so powerful is not the cross? Amen. Thousands were crucified on a cross. Yes. What makes Christianity so powerful? What makes Jesus so powerful is he rose from the grave. The power is in the resurrection of the dead. The new birth, the whole reason of being baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, is you can be resurrected. Amen. John 20 and 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The life is in the blood, and the blood is in his name. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Only Jesus can forgive sin. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none of the name under heaven given unto men, whereby we must be saved. No blood, no remission. The blood is in the name of Jesus. When the disciples were ordered not to preach about the name of Jesus. And I'm going to close. Acts chapter 5. Listen to this. They were preaching and didn't know it. They're all mad at the disciples saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You want this man's blood on the city? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Why are you preaching Jesus? Why are you living like Jesus? I want his blood on the whole city. I want him on my family. I want him in the church because it's the only way they're going to make heaven. Jesus' blood is the only legal liquid that can remedy, steal with sin. First John tells us, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin.